Hey Sea Perchers, good to have you back. My name is Hayden, and in this final build video, you are going to finish your Sea Perch ROV. You should have your frame, thrusters, and controller all finished and ready. If this is not the case, go check out my other videos on those topics and then come back. First, we're going to attach our thrusters to the controller. To do that, you will need tools to solder, 40 to 45 feet of Cat5 wire, electrical tape, liquid electrical tape, polybutyl tape or hot glue, zip ties, and a wire stripper. First, let's attach your controller to the Cat5 wire. If you bought the C-Perch build box, then it's as simple as just plugging it in. If you built your controller from scratch, like me, you're gonna have to solder the wires together. Just strip a bit of the Cat5 insulator off and strip all the ends to the wires. If you aren't using the brown wire, you can just stuff it in the box or cut it off. Now, just match up all the color wires together and solder them. Here's how you splice together a wire. We'll start with the two solid orange ones. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cross them up like this, and then fold them over each other and twist them around. It's important to wrap both of them around each other and not just one around the other, that way they stay together. Go ahead and do this for all of your colored wires. Once you're done, solder each of the connections. Soldering the wires together is pretty simple. All you gotta do is hold the soldering iron to a connection, let it heat up for about 15 seconds, and then try to push the solder onto the connection so that it flows over it. Do this for all of your colored wires. Here are what my connections look like. Once everything is soldered and cooled, you can wrap all your connections with electrical tape. Last step for you guys who built your own controller is you need to take off the top and pull the colored wires in until you get to the insulation. Once you see the insulation poking through on the other side, you're gonna take a zip tie and tie it around this part super tight and then cut off the end. Since you just pulled all your connections through the hole, make sure that all of them are still completely wrapped in electrical tape as you don't want any of the metal accidentally touching and causing a short. You can see the little zip tie right here preventing me from pulling out the wire anymore. Now I'll just put the lid of the box back on. Now we're going to attach our thrusters to the other end of the Cat5 wire. Strip a good six to eight inches of the outer insulation off and then strip all the ends of the wires. Again, just cut off your black wire or wrap it around the end right here if you don't plan on using it. Now we're going to attach thrusters to all the pairs of wires here. Twist together each of the thruster wires to a colored wire pair. Do this for all three thrusters and wire pairs. Before soldering though, make sure it's how you like it. As in, the propeller should spin forward when you push the toggle switch forward, if that's what you want. To do this, hook up your controller to a battery. Make sure none of the exposed wires aren't touching if they aren't supposed to, like here. Find the thruster that goes with your left toggle switch. Hold your hand over the propeller and push forward. If you feel air, then it's going in the right direction. If you feel air when you push the switch down, you're gonna have to switch these two wires here. You can decide for your two push button switches, you can decide which one makes your ROV go up and down, but that also depends on which way you face your vertical thruster. Once you know everything is how you like it, solder all your connections together. Don't forget to unplug your battery. Once everything is soldered and cooled, wrap all the exposed sections in electrical tape. For these connections though, I actually prefer liquid electrical tape or hot glue, as electrical tape is hard to wrap perfectly. Then your motors aren't going to spin as fast as they could. With liquid electrical tape or hot glue, this problem is permanently fixed if you do a good job. As you can see here, I've hot glued all of my connections to insulate them. If you decide to do this too, you just gotta thoroughly inspect each connection to make sure that there is no exposed wire. Now, let's waterproof this end of the cable where the insulation ends. You don't want water getting up through this cord and into your controller through capillary action. Get liquid electrical tape, hot glue, or the polybutyl tape and seal off the end the best you can. To use the polybutyl tape that came with the Sea Perch build box, first cut it into three equal sized pieces, then peel off the backing and stretch it two to three times its original length. Don't just tug on either end, stretch it out evenly. Then weave it around each of the colored wire pairs where they leave the insulation just like in the picture. Knead and work it so that it forms a nice seal. Do the same with the second piece and wrap the third around the whole thing and around the brown wire if you just wrapped it around the end. Then wrap all of the polybutyl tape with electrical tape. You can do this step with hot glue like I did, but again, you just gotta be really careful and make sure there are no holes. Now get your frame, it's time to attach your thrusters to it. There are many ways to do this. The simplest being with zip ties, and the coolest being 3D printing a thruster mount. I'll show you guys both. To attach your thrusters to the frame using zip ties, you're going to need to drill two holes, about one and a quarter inches apart on the frame. As you can see, I'm gonna put my zip tie through one of the holes, wrap it around the motor, and then put it back through the other hole and then attach the zip tie together and tighten it. Use needle nose pliers to tighten it as tight as you can. 
and now my vertical thruster is attached. 3D printing a motor mount gives you a lot more freedom to attach the thrusters how you want, but it comes out of your budget, takes some time to model and print, and is only an option if you have a 3D printer available. Plus, it might not work the first time, so you could have to retry. Even with all of those downsides, the results are pretty cool. Here's a motor mount that I designed and printed myself for a design last year. It's meant to stick into a PVC fitting, and the thruster sits snug and secure inside of its mount. As you can see, it's a lot cooler than zip ties, but it's up to you. But today though, I'm just going to use zip ties to attach the last two thrusters. There are other ways to attach your thrusters as well. And you should have been thinking about how you wanted to go about it when you designed your frame in the first place. Remember, your orange motor should be your vertical motor. The blue one should go on the left and the green on the right. Again, you want to use needle nose pliers to tighten the zip ties the best you can. And then cut off the ends using scissors. Now you just want to zip tie the end of this insulation on the wire to the back of your ROV so that when you tug on the wire, it tugs on this point instead of on your thrusters. Just like this. Now that your ROV is operational, we have to think about how it's going to complete the mission challenge. Usually, this means a hook of some sort on the front of your ROV. At the time of recording, no one knows what the challenge of this year is going to be. However, you can still design a basic hook and make modifications or changes if necessary. Or just wait until the challenge gets released to design your hook. Claws are an option as well, but it's quite a lot to figure out as you need another motor and a switch to control it. While I will say a claw can be pretty nice, I would only recommend a claw for more experienced engineers who know how to design things in a CAD program, as the claw will most likely need to be 3D printed. Let me know in the comments if you want me to make a bonus video about manipulatable claws for your ROV. Back to hooks. They can be made from many things, including things that you could find around your house. A basic option would be making the hook a part of the frame. If I wanted to do that, I could take one of these T-fittings and put one right here so that another piece of PVC sticks out. I could even fashion that piece of PVC into a point on the end, so that it can best pick up whatever it's trying to. 3D printing a hook is also a solid option. While this still requires a bit of CAD experience and access to a 3D printer, it's much easier to design a hook than a moving claw. You just have to attach it to the frame somehow, perhaps with a hole for a screw, and you can make the rest of it however you like. The hook you create should be designed to make it as easy as possible for your ROV to do the mission course, but you also have to take into consideration the obstacle course. Every year, it's the same 18-inch hoops. If your hook is too big or weirdly shaped, your ROV could get stuck around the hoops and make it hard to get it through the course. What I've ended up going with is a pencil. And what's great about this pencil is that it's neon orange, so it's gonna be super easy to see in the water. Also in the back here, I've handled all the slack with the wires with some hot glue. All right, time to hit the waves. We need to figure out the correct buoyancy for your ROV. Now that it's completed, assuming you aren't going to make any major changes, the weight of your ROV is set. What you're gonna need is your ROV and your pool noodles or other means of flotation at a body of water, along with some scissors and zip ties. Before you add any flotation, you can see that the ROV sinks when you put it in the water. What you want to try to do with your flotation is to make it so the ROV is neutrally buoyant, meaning it doesn't float or sink. You want this because when you're in the water completing the challenges, you're making very precise maneuvers and subtle up and down movements are not going to help. If you're using pool noodles, you're going to have to use scissors to cut a slit along the top like that. Here's my first try. As you can see, when I put it in the water, it now floats. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut some of the flotation off. This step is just a whole bunch of trial and error until you get it right. For my second try, I cut a lot more off from the center here. Nope, still positively buoyant. Third try, I removed some more from the middle and it actually looks pretty good. This is what neutral buoyancy looks like. You can see a very gentle tug from the tether cable will make it go up and down. If you want, you can also grab the battery and drive it around a bit. You're not gonna get too great driving practice in a bathtub, but it's something. Once you found your correct buoyancy, you can use zip ties to attach it permanently. You don't want to make these too tight or else it'll squeeze out all the air. At this point, you should have your first iteration of your ROV completed. Good work, but you're not done yet. Now you need to practice, practice, and practice some more driving and controlling your ROV. If you find a problem, fix it and try again. Fair warning, this step can take a while. The last thing I want to mention real quick is that you and your team need to decide who the reel is going to be. The reel is in charge of holding the long tether cable and releasing and retracting as necessary, making sure that it doesn't get tangled. The reel will be on the pool deck next to the driver during the competition. The reel must be a second set of eyes for the driver and call out warnings and other important things. The reel, however, is not allowed to affect the trajectory of the ROV by pulling on the tether cable. All right, engineers, this is the end of my main Sea Perch series. I hope these videos were helpful and I'm excited to see you at the International Sea Perch Competition. I'll see you there.